everybody, this is Jason. Welcome to Liberty Live. Today we're going to be discussing the secret of the 15 steps. What are the 15 steps, or shall I say the 15 songs? Now, behind me here you see a beautiful picture, a rendition of the facade of the Beth HaMikdash, the Holy House, the House of Sanctification. And before it here you notice these curved set of 15 steps. Now we know that from eyewitnesses such as Josephus, Flavinus, and so forth, that these steps were rounded. Uh, we also know that there were to be 15 steps and 15 songs, one song for each step sung on the high holidays. Now, on all of the holidays, the Jewish holidays, the biblical holidays, the feasts of the Lord, the Moedim, the appointed times, the times when God would appoint to meet with His beloved, we would enter into his house and the Lord would wash us with the word. We would sing songs, we would dance, we would be blessed. He would bless our field, our families, our nation, everything. There would be national blessings, personal blessings, corporate blessings, blessings on the church, the house of God, and on the houses that composed the house of God. Like, imagine that this is one church, one house with many congregations. But on these high holidays, they would all come from all over the world to be at headquarters. Now, an example of this is found in Matthew 26, 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they had gone out from the Mount of Olives. Or other translations read, when they had left the Mount of Olives, they had sung a hymn. Now, when Jesus and the disciples went to the Mount of Olives, it was right after the Passover Seder, the final meal, the Last Supper. This is... Uh, uh, preceding event before the crucifixion. He's in the garden and they are praying in the Garden of Olives, the Olive Garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, when they're praying in the garden, they end up singing a song. What was that song and why were they singing at night? We have only two events, one in Mark, one in Matthew that says the Lord sings. Uh, now, because this is a holy week and they're singing a song, it lines up with all of the traditions and biblical uh, if you look at all the scriptures around, like when we cross the Red Sea, they sang a new song. In Revelation, they sang a new song. Every time God did something wonderful, they encapsulated this truth into the context of a song, not only to give praise to God and to make it absolutely beautiful, and the fact that God inhabits the praise and thanks of His people, they would not only capture history to retell it, but as they're doing so, the, the anointing, the Spirit, and God, the God of the anointing and the God of the Spirit, would refresh the saints as we remember the wonderful things that we share in Christ. This is, for example, in Philemon 1.6. It says, I pray that you would be fervent in sharing your faith so you have an active understanding in every good thing you have in Jesus Christ. In other words, by refreshing others, you yourself will be refreshed. By sharing what you have, then you also understand and realize what you have been given. Okay, so... In your Bibles, there's 150 psalms or songs. Now, before the uh, canonization of scriptures, these were scrolls. And when it became in book form, it was called the Psalter. The Psalter is the book of psalms, all 150, which we all know were songs, poems, and prayers, mostly written by King David to be ministered or sang by his chief musicians in the temple and in the place called Zion, which was the tabernacle tent after we moved it from Shiloh and, um, and uh, Gibeon. It, it moved to uh, Zion, which was across the street from uh, the Temple Mount, if you will, literally. And these songs were sang during the holidays. When, and um, remember, there'd be like a, maybe a quarter, half a million people here in this Temple Mount complex, okay? And so... As it is written, for an example, on Passover, they sing the songs at night. What songs are they singing? They're called the Grand Hillel Psalms, like Psalm 113, 115, 118. And they say things like, Great is the Lord, most worthy to be praised. And then, He delivered us from Egypt. Praise be to God, the God of gods. He delivered us from Og, king of Bashan. Or, um, you know, any of the triumphs. He parted the sea that we may walk through. He crossed over the Jordan by the strength of His hand. All of these things are remembering the wonderful things that God has done, not only to give praise and glory to God for what He has done, and by singing them and Him refreshing us by His Spirit and wind and anointing of what He is doing, but also it is a faith-telling, a foretelling of faith 
of what God is going to do or what he's capable of doing so that we're not limited by unbelief when Jesus has gone so far as to say, whatever you believe, so shall it be according to the will of God. So in the Psalms 150, there are 15 Psalms that capture this reality. Turn with me to Psalm 120. Now, all of the Psalms, for an example, say a prayer of David, a song to be sung, a song of Korah, uh, a mascal of Ethan, one of the musicians of the Lord, uh, another psalm, a song for giving thanks, a prayer for affliction, uh, a psalm of David. But when we get to Psalm 120, it changes the subtitle and it reads, A Song of Ascents. Now this word, ascents, to go up, may also be transliterated as, as a song of steps. Someone says, what's that mean, song of steps? A song for each step. Now, we have to put ourselves in the context that this is the court of prayer, which would later be called the court of Israel, which would later be called the court of women. And in here gathered male and female. For example, this is the room where the lepers went to be made clean. People went to make Nazarite vows to get uh, oil, wine, and wheat for the temple, temple wood to burn on the altar that the fire would never go out. And what we see here is uh, the 15 steps, for an example, that Mary and Joseph would ascend when they dedicated Jesus in the temple when he was held by Simeon. Uh, this is where Anna prayed and fasted, for an example, before the presence of Hashem, presence of the Lord. And here's the Nicanor gate, the gate in which we open up, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise. That's the gate you enter when you enter into the court of praise, the Azara Hallel. Azara means the courts of help, the courts where God helps us, where the priests are, where the altar is, and Hallel is hallelujah, hallelujah, to praise God. And so this is where the realities of what we experience in temple and church worship, this is where it all came from. And so as we enter into these steps, you have to realize each step you're going up to a higher consciousness, a higher level, a higher commitment, a higher understanding, a higher freedom, a higher act of becoming one with God, since this is the house of God, the closer you get. It's kind of like when you go to someone's house and you walk up the steps before you ring the doorbell. You're beginning to ascend to a new reality, a new habitation. So, Psalm 120, a song of ascents. Psalm 121, a song of ascents. 122, song of ascents. 123, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 100, and 31, 32, 133, and finally 134, a song of ascents. And I find it interesting that these songs, and, and they are condensed. A lot of the Psalms, for example, 136 is pretty long, 135, 133 is here, 134 is here. I mean, two, three verses. These are things they would sing on each step during the final holiday of the year, which is Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's where we get Thanksgiving from, the tradition of Thanksgiving. So I find it interesting, though, one thing I wanted to tell you about the secret of 15 steps is not only is it amazing, right, that these steps are a memorial to entering into another place of gratitude, another place of remembrance, another place of worship. But at the final step, they're also a place of preparation to prepare your heart, prepare your soul, prepare your spirit. On the final step, it says, come and bless the Lord. In other words, enter into this gate with thanksgiving, enter into his courts, the Azara, his courts with praise, with Hillel. Before you enter into the gate, you have to finish the final step, the 15th step, Psalm 134. Come Come, right? Like enter in, come on in and bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. In other words, you wouldn't be here if you weren't serving the Lord. Who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Also means the servants of the Lord, literally the presbytery, the ministers and the presbytery, those who, those who receive and those who give, for we are one. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. First of all, Paul said, I would have men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And what's the holy place? Well, the holy place is before the Kodesh HaKodeshim, before the holy place, the holy of holies is what it's called. So first you have the holy place, where is the golden altar, the altar of prayer, the menorah, the Urhalam, the light of the world, and the table of showbread, our living and daily bread. That's the holy place. The holy of holies is, of course, where the Ark of the Covenant is kept behind the veil. So towards the holy place means towards the facade of the temple. God, we're here. Praise it. Blessed be your name. I think this is amazing. It says, may the Lord bless you from Zion. In other words, 
this mountain technically is Mount Moriah. Zion is where David put the tent of David, the tabernacle of David, which was the tabernacle of Moses, moved from, uh, from Gibeon and from Shiloh and from the 40 to 41 places they moved all as they were encamped through the desert into the city of David. Now Solomon, David's son, moves it across the street into a permanent house. But God said his presence would dress, dwell and rest forever on Zion. And what was Zion? It was the first place actually saying, God, I have, to, I have a house. You have to have a house. Right? Like we have to treat God the way that we want to be treated. We must make a place for God where he can dwell. Now before that, God said, make me a place. But after that, we said, we must make you a place. May we make you a place. In other words, it shifted from a commandment from God to man to uh, a contending from man to God. In other words, creation has finally entered its proper context with creator. The son has returned to the father and his heart is rendered unto him. Beloved, when we enter into the steps of God's house, God's presence, God's prayer, God's praise, it's not a light thing. We have to understand as uh, the responsibility increases, sometimes the gravity changes, the oxygen changes, the elevation changes, the altitude and the attitude change. But you also have to remember that when you enter into his courts with thanksgiving, his gate with praise, in the Azara, the courts, is the altar. And you have to remember, whoever goes to the altar will be altered. So someone says, I can't ascend to the Lord. I'm not, I'm not right. Or, well, I'm not, I'm not feeling good. I shouldn't go to church. I mean, or, or you know, I sinned. I messed up too bad. God, I think he's done with me. No, no, beloved. Enter in and become altered. Right? There's an invitation. Come, all you servants of the Lord, and be blessed. Come and be blessed. Now, who, but it also says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Only he whose heart is pure who casts no stir against his fellow man, who keeps his word even if it hurts, and performs the will of his God. So this is the invitation of Jesus Christ. Come up the steps on earth as it is in heaven. Come into the presence of God. Come in. Someone says, how do I come in? Where's the steps, beloved? Open your heart to God. And come up here, as he said to John, the apostle, the book of Revelation. Come up here. Come up, come, says the Lord your God.